welcome to part two of this webcast lecture about the Bourbon Restoration in France between 1815 and 1830 and the revolution of 1830 and the subsequent July monarchy. Symbols are important in politics and one aspect of the imposed restoration of the Bourbon monarchy after 1814-1815 was the abolition of the red, white and blue French tricolour flag as well of course as the abolition of the Marseillaise as the national anthem, uh, the anthem being replaced by, replaced by a sort of French version of God Save the King. Uh, the flag, the red, white and blue flag was replaced by a white flag with a gold fleur-de-lis on it, the symbol of the Bourbon monarchy. And in the first months of the Restoration, there was a period known as the White Terror. During the French Revolution, there was the Terror, um, very much associated in people's minds with the Revolution because of writers like Edmund Burke. Um, but there was a, a kind of smaller version of the Terror called the White Terror, which was directed against the supporters of the Revolution, uh, Jacobin leaders and especially military leaders, particularly those who were thought to have been associated with the massacre of royalist supporters uh, during the revolutionary times and the Napoleonic time. In theory, Louis was a constitutional monarch held in check by a national chamber or national convention. In reality, he was really an absolute tyrant, um, although he was quite moderate and modest in the way that he ruled. Only 80,000 people in the whole of France entitled to vote. Short reign, because he died in 1824 of natural causes, the short reign was marked by stagnation more than anything else, and I suppose a growing power of the Catholic Church. In foreign policy, Louis XIX sent a French army under royalist colours into Spain to suppress a liberal reformist movement on behalf of the Holy Alliance. It also assisted the Austrians in putting down a similar liberal experiment in the Kingdom of Naples. The press was muzzled, the economy was stagnant, some of the debt was paid off by making the central expenses of the state much cheaper. Stagnation at a time when England is roaring away. The steam phase of the Industrial Revolution is getting underway in England so that by 1830 the whole country of England had a moderately extensive railway system. Uh, the French, uh, it was another 20 or 30 years till they got going with that. The English had, had also started using steamships and they'd spent, sent steamships across the Atlantic by 1820. Um, France was becoming more and more backward. The peasants were happy enough. They had enough land now to, to feed themselves in, in most years. But trade, industrial development, uh, industrial development uh, under the Bourbons uh, fell uh, well behind. In 1824, Louis died and he was succeeded by his brother, who became Charles X. Charles was a much more reactionary and much more religious figure. He was immediately a source of ridicule, but at the same time unease, because he had absolutist power. Ridicule amongst Paris elites for the nature of his coronation, which was a full-blown uh, medieval pageant, which involved him lying at one point on a sort of velvet table and being uh, impregnated, uh, pricked with a special golden knife, uh, and then into which holy oil was rubbed in order to give him divine powers. They're kind of consecrated by dozens of kind of papal legates and bishops and things like this. The whole thing was really quite extraordinary. It reminds me a bit of the Shah of Iran's uh, coronation in the uh, late 1970s that so upset the people of Iran. In the medievalism of this, it's kind of neo-Gothic nature. You can see the conservative side of the Romantic movement just as Goethe had welcomed the Congress of Vienna and the creation of the Holy Alliance uh, as a good idea for mankind to secure a bit of peace against the constant revolution of the Napoleonic era. France now was this uh, rural peasant country ruled over by a medieval monarchy, uh, very much kicking against the general trend in especially England uh, and starting to happen in America and to some extent in Germany by this point. France was going back in time English historian H.A.L. Fisher reports Charles as saying he would rather chop wood 
and be a constitutional monarch in the fashion of the King of England. Fisher say Charles was deaf to all the calls of the future, obedient only to the voice of the past. He was ruling over a lively and sceptical generation of Frenchmen, still largely pagan and becoming increasingly lib, and they learned with amused contempt how the new king had got himself crowned. Uh, according to ancient rites uh, in the Cathedral of Rheims. When this medieval ceremony was followed by a law granting pecuniary compensation to the émigrés, and by another law enacting stern penalties for sacrilege, and by a royal order dissolving the National Guard, amusement at these medievalist antics um, turned to a gathering volume, says Fisher, of impatience, irritation and fear. So there were three decrees that were unpopular at the elites in Paris. The first was the proposal to restore land, or at least give financial compensation, to aristocrats who'd had their estates broken up during the revolution, those who had survived the guillotine by fleeing into exile, these people known in French language as émigrés. Second was the proposal to make sacrilege punishable by death, extraordinary state of affairs in the country of Voltaire, which during the Enlightenment had prized freedom of expression above almost all else. When Charles abolished the National Guard, it was widely said in Paris that he was about to bring about a coup d'etat uh, to abolish even the limited constitutional chamber of deputies and to rule as an absolute monarch, in other, in other words, to bring about a complete restoration of the ancien regime this would be an end to even a fig leaf of democracy. And more worrying than that, though, for most people, was the idea that then the land would be reconfiscated off the small peasant farmers and given back to the aristocratic landlords and to the church estate. Charles then appointed Polignac as his prime minister, his chief advisor. Polignac was an ultra-reactionary who said that his actions were were divinely guided, that he had visions from the Virgin Mary, didn't need to consult the Chamber of Deputies or anybody else because he would make policy for France on instruction from God. Then, as his Minister of War, Charles X appointed a general who had directly betrayed Napoleon and gone over to the side of the emigres, had gone over to the side of the Austrians and the Prussians and actually fought and killed Frenchmen uh, during the Napoleonic War. Thus, in July 1830, barricades were erected all over Paris, and an insurrection took place under the flag of the tricolor, the revolutionary flag against the white flag of the monarchy. The crucial figure was Lafayette, grand old man of the revolution and the Bonapartist years, uncontroversial and now somewhat conservative figure. He was against another revolution, such as, such as that against the monarchy in 1793. Uh, what he proposed was a constitutional monarchy much, much more explicitly on English lines. And the man they found to do it was uh, Louis Philippe, the royal house of Orleans. He was, the, he was an aristocrat, or the son of an aristocrat, who had nevertheless fought in the revolutionary armies and who had voted for the establishment of the Republic. Louis Philippe said that... Uh, as king, it would be his explicit role to usher in a form of parliamentary democracy that uh, with the executive power he could, he could bring that in. In this way, France could modernise itself and become liberal and start to try and catch up once again with the uh, English. In 1814, at the Congress of Vienna, Metternich had said that whenever Paris sneezes, the whole of Europe catches a cold. And so it was again during the July Revolution in 1830. It was imitated in Brussels, where the Belgians rose up against rule by the Dutch that had been imposed as part of the Congress of Vienna settlement, the reactionary settlement in Europe. Henceforth, Belgium would be an independent country and casting well into the future of history once the establishment of an independent Belgium, uh, supported diplomatically by the English, uh, was to be one of the direct causes of English involvement in the First World War when the Germans invaded Belgium. 1830 also saw an uprising in Poland, and it was probably the need to suppress that that prevented the reactionary emperors Austria, Prussia and Russia invading France to, to keep uh, Charles X on the throne. This is the end of part two of this webcast lecture about France in the 1820s and 1830s. The next part, part three, deals with the nature of the July monarchy. Music